I, um, I grew up in South Texas, and uh, my family's been there since it was part of Mexico. And uh, everybody in my family has in some way been employed by the border. Uh, my family is, is in, you know, involved in business and commerce, and, uh, and also you know, parts of my members and my family were involved in drug trafficking. Uh, <laughs> Others were um, work for ICE, and C, uh, CIA, uh, police, and uh, others. My uncle was a coyote, a human trafficker, and now I'm a journalist, <laughs> <laughs> covering it. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, so I spent I've spent the last uh, many years looking at the landscape around where I grew up. And uh, when I was a kid, you know, some of my earliest memories were of migrants and encountering migrants crossing. I've lived in Mexico for about the last 10 years. And um, during that time, I, for some years, I was working as a photojournalist, traveling to uh, Central America and other parts of the world. And I started to feel this disconnect with my homeland and where I grew up. And so uh, my grandmother had this old Polaroid camera. And so, and I found this stack of pictures, and so I started making pictures like she did of my family. And what I found is as I was going fishing with my dad and hunting, and uh, in the same weeks that I was there, I was also uh, photographing the types of atrocities that we see on the border. Things like this, where migrants who have tried to make their way into the United States cross the Rio Grande, and have gone far into the interior to avoid the checkpoints that exist uh, nearly 100 kilometers north of our border. To avoid those, they go deep into uh, the Texas Monte, and they often get lost and die. Um, and so when I was doing this reporting, I, uh, I was about maybe 20. I was on assignment for Michael Lucille, actually. He was the one that gave me my first break. Uh, working for the Washington Post. And I met this woman from Honduras who was uh, lost and um, very, very sick. And she told me that she had been traveling for quite a long time. And I was very much confused as to the, that reality, being like a young man in that world and seeing, OK, we're in the middle of nowhere on a ranch in Texas. It's like 105 degrees outside. This person is alone. And the desperation that that took was something I didn't comprehend from a privileged American standpoint. So I went to, to Central America. I, I worked in, in Honduras, covering sort of the push factors of political violence that were happening there. Um, things uh, like land loss and uh, property rights for African palm oil and you know, military uh, actions against gang members. And I made my way to Ciudad Juarez, uh, where I've spent probably most of my career working, uh, predominantly looking at the children of factory workers who manufacture goods for the US, things that we all buy here in this country and in other nations that export from there. But the problem is, in these communities, these border communities, people don't make enough money really to eat and to even uh, take care of their kids. So they end up on the street. And they became funneled into gangs. Uh, many of them who I met and knew have been murdered. And during that time, I was hearing stories from people who I loved and I cared about, people like this couple, Pollo, who's, uh, who I'm actually his uh, child's godfather. And I became very involved in situations where I was hearing things no longer as a journalist, but much more as a friend. And so. At the end of that, you know, I come back each trip and I have my stack of pictures and I'm processing all of this stuff. And I'm, I'm a young guy, I don't really, I didn't have a lot of experience as a journalist, but I also had all of these emotional questions about right and wrong. I grew up super Catholic and uh, my family, you know, had these, uh, because of its complex color and our characters of who were members of my family, I always had these doubts about what was right and wrong. <laughs> and I was a little mischievous. So anyway, so I started writing fiction. Uh, I come from a literature background. So I wrote this, my, my first book. It took me five years uh, with the help of people like Lisa Factor and Jeremy Ralph and uh, Danya Taymor. And I wrote this first novel. And I included 
documentary materials inside of the book with the intention of sort of reinforcing that narrative. And the fiction allowed me to include dialogues and pieces of conversation that I'd heard, and also stories that often were tragic, but that allowed me to attribute those stories to sometimes fictional characters. And that allowed me to tell those stories in a way that wasn't really safe sometimes for those people who I cared so much about. And fiction gave that photograph breath. But because I get bored, <laughs> uh, I, along the way I met Danya Tamor, um, and she and I worked together with the New York Theater Workshop, and we put together an installation representation of this work. Uh, Lisa Factor helped us to curate this piece and put it together. I mean, she's been mentoring me through this whole process. And uh, along with Hiko Reyes, we put together an installation and presentation of this at El Museo de, de Hijo de Aguisote in Mexico City where people could interact with the documentary materials, see things like my National Geographic magazine, uh, the notes from uh, some of the things that I had seen, and also click through the photographs. I built this sculpture that was based on the crosses that mothers leave behind for their uh, missing daughters. After interviewing for years many, many of these women, uh, recently, actually while I was reporting for the Geographic, I was uh, able to go to some of the first oil, oral testimonies in uh, Chihuahua State and in northern Mexico. And these led to the conviction of five members of the Azteca gang who were involved in human trafficking and murdering of these young women. Now, I spent three days in there, and I did make pictures. I was allowed to photograph. But at the end, the photographs did not in any way really represent the things that I had heard for all of these years. And so what I did was I, I made this sculpture out of neon, and then in behind it, I made the, the loops of the buses that take the factory workers uh, and Juarez to work. And then we got two actresses from Ciudad Juarez, one to play a reporter and one to play a fictionalized character uh, who has escaped from this setting. And she's explaining exactly the hardships that she's been through. Since working on that, I've, uh, I met David Pablos in Tijuana. Uh, he's a fantastic film director, for those of you who aren't familiar with his work. Uh, and he has guided me and helped me over the last year to really shape that narrative into something that we can use for cinema. And just in October, the rights to the story were uh, purchased by uh, Ina Payan's uh, company. And so hopefully in 2020, we'll be filming that fiction narrative about two young boys, one who grows up uh, in a family of, of, of gang members and Sicario Hitman and another who, uh, because of the circumstances of his life and sort of the outside pressures, he ends up committing violence. And the question then lies, like, which one is really morally correct and, and how do these things play out in a place without law and order? But as I was traveling uh, all of these places, I started to look at the border differently. And I realized that this line that we often think of as a community divided is actually a unique and common experience from east to west. You know, we have our own language of Spanglish, which uh, we love and adore. Uh, you know, there is uh, different types of music and all these kinds of things that we culturally share with these communities. But also the history of this place was very important. Um, things, and I felt like here as an American, it was really important for me to reflect back on our past. I think often, um, because our seat of power is in a place like Washington, we tend to be a European-facing nation. And we tend to look at those groups from you know, the Greeks and the British and all of these other empires, and now we have ourselves become a colonial empire. And I think that it's important to look back and remember things like this in Taos, where uh, hundreds of Puebloan people were bombarded by the US military in 1848, and things like this in the Las Vegas affair. After the Mexican-American War, there were still people fighting for their freedom in places like New Mexico. And this is the site where three New Mexican rebels were killed in their fight for independence of the border nation. Um, as I was there traveling too, I, I, I came across this phenomenon, which many of you may have seen, but where people come up to the border and they, to avoid the long lines and all of these sort of things that we have to deal with, communicate with one another through this fence. And sometimes they sit for hours, they bring their puppies, they hang out. And it's really this kind of beautiful symbolic representation to me of that this community divided by a line but connected communi like, through communication and through history. Uh, 
for my National Geographic Fellowship, I've also been photographing along the border wall, but also deep south into northern Mexico, as far south as into Chihuahua, uh, Monterrey, um, going far north into uh, parts of Texas and California, because there is a lot of symbolic representation of culture, things, and also a lot of history. Places like this, this young boy who's uh, from California in a community of Mexican-Americans that's been there since the 1800s. And going to things like this, uh, Father's Day Carnesada, which looks a lot like something that you might see where I grew up, but is in a rural part of Chihuahua. And also covering the continuing uh, flood of migrants who are escaping violence and landing uh, in our uh, ranches and lands around South Texas. Now, uh, I've been thinking more and more about what connects us. And one of the things that I've been interested in for a long time is, is drawing. And uh, I like working with ink. And I've been fascinated by textiles, and particularly bandanas. I and mean, anybody that knows me knows I have a crazy collection of bandanas. Um, they're super useful. You know, you can like put them up in the window when you're driving across the border, and you don't get sunburned. You know, you can wear them around your neck. And so I drew these pictures to represent some of the things along the border. This is a this is a lizard, uh, horn-toed lizard from. Uh, that lives in the borderlands that's going extinct, guys. So it's any of you scientists out there that are working on this, I applaud you because I love them as kids. And if you look under your seats, you will all find nothing. I'm kidding. 